Hello, this is Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt of the Christ School of Theology. If you've tuned into this, you're watching a series of lectures having to do with the philosophical underpinnings of theology. We talked at the beginning of the course about some general features of philosophical thinking and how they intersect and relate to the theological project. We have been talking in recent weeks about uh, specific uh, philosophical systems or thinkers and how that may uh, have uh, influence to theological thinking. Uh, the last uh, 10 lectures I did, they're very short actually, so I don't think 10 lectures are 10 hours, 10 10 minute lectures. Uh, we're over uh, Duns Scotus, who is of course the, the last great thinker in the Via Antiqua, right? And now we're going to move to his pupil, William of Ockham. William of Ockham. And uh, Ockham, you're going to see spelled in many ways. You see it spelled this way. Uh, you see it spelled this way uh, occasionally. But now it seems like most people are spelling it uh, William of Ockham in this way. He's a great logician. <laughs> He's the founder of the Via Moderna. That's the modern way of thinking. He is a great nominalist. Now, nominalism, if you're not familiar with the word, that term comes uh, from the Latin nomen. Uh, a nomina words, if you think that sheep doesn't refer to some sheep nature that exists in many different places at once, uh, but just as a word that classifies these beings together, if you will, then you are a nominalist in the traditional old sense of nominalism. That is that everything finally uh, devolves to naming, right? But when we talk about nominalism, we talk about nominalism over and against uh, uh, other views. Uh, Nominalists believe uh, only in the ontological existence of particulars. So generally in philosophy, we have the so-called problem of particulars and universals. And uh, I went to a school of uh, philosophy uh, that took this very seriously, University of Iowa, uh, very seriously uh, was interested in the ontological status of universals versus particulars. If you're a nominalist, you're holding that only particulars exist and that universals must be given an analysis somehow. Putative in, uh, universals must be given an analysis somehow in terms of uh, particulars. We'll get into this more. Uh, Occam uh, follows uh, Scotus in his distinction between the two powers of God, the, abs the potentia dei absoluta and the potentia dei ordinata. And he follows Scotus. Uh, he, he claims that the sharper we get in our thinking, uh, the fewer things we can prove about God. So philosophical speculation for Occam really leads to no uh, articles of faith. Philosophy can show only the gap between philosophy and theology. While he claims that the entire body of Christian teachings are true, they have no self-evidence. They are the posit of revelation. Occam claimed that the continuity of faith uh, is established by what is true, truth conditions of theological language, and that the truth and the church, which attests to the truth, can be preserved in only one person. So if there's only one person that believes the truth, uh, the church is perpetuated. Church continues as long as one person has the correct faith. This is really a lot different than calling a bunch of people together in the late summer and uh, uh, having a vote on what's true, how the church operates in some circles these days. We won't say which ones. Though Scotus was not yet anomalist, uh, he certainly opened the way to an, em an emphasis upon the singular and the individual. We talked about his heikety, right? He was so infatuated with individuals that he gave a certain property, uh, a heikety, an individual essence, if you will. Every Socrates has his own heikety. 
So he's very interested in individuals. Well, well, Occam's not going to go the way of Heikety. That is a bloated ontology. Uh, but he is going to uh, follow SCOTUS in a lot of ways and uh, uh, make uh, what SCOTUS starts to do uh, more uh, bold, even. So Occam takes the positions of his teacher further, and he became the architect of late medieval nominalism. He uses analysis in order to advance an epistemological nominalism, all that we know are particulars and particular qualities, and a critical skepticism. We can't know much by reason alone about the nature of those things that transcend reason. Now, if you're thinking about other important nominalist thinkers, think Adam Godem or Robert Holcott, very famous, or Johannes Buridan, or Marsilius of Ignan, or my favorite Pierre de Ali, Peter de Ali. And if you've read uh, the great text by Heiko Obermann, The Harvest of Medieval Theology, you know that all of this ends with Gabriel Beale, right? Beale. See, he's getting close to Beale felt, right? Got the Beale. Okay, uh, Occam uh, was born in 1287 or 88, we don't know which. Uh, he lived a little longer than Scotus, but by no means uh, a super long life. He died in 1324, I think that's right. He's born in the village of Occam, yes. The word Occam means Oak Hamlet in the town of Surrey, uh, which is a day's ride southwest of London. He probably learned Latin in the village school there in uh, Occam, and sometimes between the age of 7 and 13, uh, he was given to the Franciscan order, that's the order of the Grey Friars, in London. Uh, at uh, the Grey Friars, Occam learned logic and natural philosophy. Actually, this was a really great place to be. If you weren't going to be at the university, this was the second best place to be at uh, a place such as this, the Franciscan Grey Friars. He began his theological training uh, in 1310, maybe at London Convent or, or perhaps at Oxford. He began to lecture on uh, uh, Lombard sentences in 1317. He studied in Oxford uh, before his return to the Grey Friars in 1321, and he never completed his theology program at Oxford, so he did not have a PhD. Uh, in theology. You know, I need to go back here. I know that's not right. I said 1324. I know that it's later. I think he died in right 1347 or 48 or something. I know that that's not right. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's not right. Anyway, uh, his views were held in suspicion. Uh, so uh, as he was teaching there at Oxford, he was called to Avignon to defend, to defend them in 1324. And uh, he wrote his Quad Libets. Uh, his whatevers, whatever questions, uh, while there at Avignon. Uh, he was supposed to be there and they were supposed to be examining him. It seemed to give him a great deal of time to actually do theology. So he wrote a lot there. Uh, that they came up with some things against what he said, but no one really went through with this. This was not a heart, uh, harrowing experience for our good friend William of Ockham. He defended the Franciscan view that the followers of Christ should practice radical poverty. This got him into trouble with the Pope. Uh, he went into exile then with the support of uh, King Ludwig of Bavaria. Uh, and then he went to Munich in 1329 and stayed there until his death in 1347. I believe that's right. Okay, uh, his works. I will come right back and I will tell you what his works are. This is Dr. Dennis Bielfeld of the Christ School of Theology. Come right back and we'll talk about William of Ockham. Thanks. Thanks.